most schools today, a kid will make the honor roll if they're really good at memorizing content, replicating low-level procedures, and following instruction. We just have to understand as educators, it's, it's no more, we can't do textbook knowledge anymore. It's, it's those soft skills that we've got to teach these kids. It's can you problem solve on your own? Can you make mistakes and learn from the mistakes? Can you communicate? And can you produce quality work? Growing up, we, we were told that we need to get good grades, and that will translate into maybe a standardized test score or a good GPA and then a good SAT score. We get into a good college and then we get a good career and that'll be a good life. But nowadays, that's not necessarily true. The old narrative was you do well in elementary, you do, then that gives you a success in middle school, high school, college en enrollment, college graduation, a career, and then a pension. Uh, most kids these days don't even know what a pension is. When I think what's best for my students, I've been corrected even to think more globally. What's best for all students? And what's best for all students are 21st century skills, not rote standardized tests, not ranking kids, but once again finding their own joy of learning and then being able to get to a deeper learning competency so they can share out their learning in an exhibition or a presentation of learning. We also have some teachers that want to be innovative, that want to um, engage students and I think that's the critical piece of getting students engaged, uh, wanting to be a part of that process of learning, saying what they want to learn and how they want to learn it. There's a fear if we continue to do the same thing the way we've been doing it and not making any changes, we're going to get the same results. When you go around and you see, and I've been to some of these schools, and you see stuff that's going on in the classrooms and you talk with kids, man, there's some incredible stuff happening. So why, why should we be talking about transformation in the negative when we already have positives that we're building off of? We're not starting from zero or from a deficit. What I see again is that people are okay with not being the teacher who has to know everything. I think just them feeling comfortable with not being the sole person to pass off knowledge or to teach. To me, those are the opportunities that I want them to be okay with opening up to the kids. We need to empower the students more and more and more and more. And that's, I think, probably the biggest goal, be more and more student empowerment. How do you create an environment where those that are venturing out doing bolder things, creating distinctive learning environments in a way that they believe is really going to work for their kids, feel supportive and encouraged and celebrated? One of the things I've learned to, to really appreciate is that teachers have a really deep understanding of what type of class or what type of school they'd love to um, bring to their students. If you can create an environment in a school community where everybody's really excited about those teachers that are innovating, suddenly you won't have one teacher, you'll have 10 teachers innovating, and that's contagious. And so 10 teachers will go to 15, to 20, to 30, to 40. When you're trying to get your community excited about change, it really helps to connect with them emotionally and give them some vision, some tangible sense of what's possible. So we're not it's suggesting or encouraging people to completely rethink school, you just try something light and agile and gain some experience. The Innovation Playlist is really a set of supportive and suggestive resources that are available to educators anywhere, anytime. And it's based on a few core principles. This model that says Start with small steps, build confidence, have a clear sense of what ultimately you'd love to accomplish, but have a almost like an on-ramp or a path so that these small steps can be taken in a coordinated fashion that over time lead to big change. And the other key aspect of the, the Innovation Playlist model is not to make every teacher do it, but to invite the innovators to do it and celebrate not special teachers, that celebrate interesting practices. And if you get a healthy amount of your faculty starting to move in a great direction, then that infectious spirit, that contagious enthusiasm for it takes over. It's really grassroots, 
one step at a time, but one joyful step in a really clear direction, instead of somebody from on high saying, you will, or trying to do it all at once, which sounds so tempting, but often leads to, you know, chaos and discontent that just drags down the process. When you think about how you begin to transform a learning experience from, you know, what worked really well in the last century, which was largely a teacher delivering content material to students, which at a time when that was the only way to do it was a sensible thing to do, to a more modern classroom where students are working on ambitious challenges tied to the real world, learning what they need to learn to get there. There are certain elements that, that really do facilitate and accelerate that transformation. And there are teachers in schools that are really comfortable and good at that. And so one of the things we hope to accomplish with this playlist structure is for a school, for a complex, for a state, for those masters at that aspect of pedagogical practice to be able to step forward and coach up other teachers to help them. And then as more and more teachers get good at it, they in turn become coaches. And before you know it, you've got not dozens, not hundreds, but thousands of teachers. And when that starts to happen, I think people get this sense in a way that's not dramatically overhauling everything, but a short burst with permission and encouragement, with teachers collaborating and students connected to real world problems. So this is just a grand opportunity, and if you get a whole group of people together making a shift, you know, that's going to be super significant. You know, when the timing is right, when the conditions are right, the movement, you see movement. And I think right now we're creating these um, initial steps to get that movement rolling. How do you think outside the box? Or how do you get rid of that box? Teachers are always wanting to improve what they do, that's just the nature of a teacher. And when you start to listen to what their needs are, you say, okay, well, we can take care of that, or that's a resource that we can provide professional development in that area, we can do that. And so it just begins this culture of, of you, where you want to improve your practice and your craft, and I think that's where a lot of our teachers um, just want that opportunity. seize that opportunity and just know that there's there's a lot of folks that are that are rooting for this to happen there are a lot of folks that are wanting this change to happen so I would say jump in it's gonna be a great ride let's have students um, other talents celebrated you know not just your reading and math what makes them feel good about coming to school is not only having a safe environment but feeling valued and feeling like there's a purpose to what they're doing and celebrating their other talents and bringing that out of them so that they feel successful. In the immediate, I talked to the students today. They watched um, the video about um, what is school for and so they're going to be having some conversations this afternoon about what they want to see from school and then Change is hard. You know, I mean, if change were easy, none of us would be doing what we're doing. I, I think that one of the ironies right now about education is that people broadly understand we need to be doing something different, but there's still this epic struggle in school after school, county after county, state after state, country after country to affect change. The first year I was principal I had um, a fabulous mentor that kind of just fell into my sphere and that was Daryl Galera. And Mr. Galera uh, was always positive, he was always saying tell me more about what you're thinking and he actually got me to host at the Waimea Theater a showing of Most Likely to Succeed. And and it was fabulous, right? And I think maybe that movie spurred all the other things that were happening along the way. Most Likely to Succeed does that. It's an emotional story. People are in tears at times at the end because you watch the journey of these two students and the teachers so dedicated to supporting them. 
but you, you sort of are connected emotionally as well as logically with a very different vision of what school could be. And you relate to that. That story has impact beyond the logic of, of a very rational argument. And when schools see it, that community gets really excited about change. So I think it plays a really important role, but I think it's also proven to be a really helpful resource to schools as they, they try to give a more nuance and more, a more complete picture of what, how broad, how incredibly distinctive the types of learning experiences schools and teachers can create. So it is the exact opposite of cookie cutter standardized. Good morning. How are you? It's been great, hasn't it? You know, Sir Ken Robinson is a, an iconic figure. And the talk just resonates. And the reason I think it's an important part of the playlist is it's incredibly captivating. Nobody watches it says, why did you waste my time or that was boring. I mean, people just lean in on that talk. But it really sort of makes you step back and say, boom, what, what if we kind of in some ways have it all wrong? What if the very skills and character traits we want our kids to have are not only not being amplified through these years in school, but actually being diminished? And then what could we do to reverse that? What could we do to take creative, ask a million questions, intensely curious kindergarten kids and have them leave high school even more so instead of, as I see way too often today in high schools, the only questions kids will ask in most high schools I visit is, will this be on the test? When I think about mobilizing, it sounds everybody is getting in. Yeah? Everybody's, there's action. And you make something move, but there's some kind of action that's happening. And I feel like the teachers, and just based on some of what we've seen here, um, they have been. There's action behind their step. There's purpose behind what they're doing. And they're understanding that there is a purpose. We're not doing to do. We're doing because. We're doing for. Right. We're doing to provide. I get surprised all the time on ways that others might have approached a different problem in a different way than I would have, and the outcome was incredible and what that's done is, is not just the outcome but what it did for that person and that person all of a sudden felt very empowered and in, might give them that next step to take another you know riskier step and that might motivate another colleague to say oh I saw my colleague take a risk and hey you know I liked how that looked I liked how that felt and then that shared distributed leadership and then you have now a whole team of people willing to try new things and I think that's where it starts. The innovation playlist, like I said, came at a time where I was just like, I'm already sparked. I'm excited to do this. Like, let's get everyone else fired up. And so it gave me the tools to do that. And, a, and a, I don't want to say framework because that sounds like a mandate, but tools. It gave me um, a jumping off point to get other people excited. How do you walk in the shoes of a student? What are they perceiving? Um, I, I work with teenagers and um, as an adult, I, I always have to think, okay, I've gone through this many, many times. For the student, this may be the first time they're going through this experience. Shadowing is different than a walkthrough, a look for, an observation, an instructional supervision experience. After a while, they kind of forget you're there. I personally um, implemented off the playlist um, shadowing a student. Um, it was very eye-opening for me as far as um, you know, being really in that ground level and experiencing the student's day. You know, Ian Jukes said uh, we need to prepare students for their future and not our past. And when you shadow a student, and I imagine what they saw is that you're time traveling. You're traveling back in time, present time, and future time. And my first um, shadowing was such an eye-opening experience for me as a school leader that all the professional development things that we've been doing were not really getting into the classroom. They relax into whatever they are. 
So they relax into being a, a teacher that talked for 80% of the time. Um, they relax into giving students work that they've designed that the students had no part of. Or they relax into the fact that they're an awesome teacher who's walking around the classroom and, and, and giving the agency of the learning to the student. So actually, I tell that teacher, you know what, no matter how fearful you might be, how excited you might be, that you're going to forget I'm there and that you are going to get into a rhythm because I'm there for longer than you've ever had an administrator or a colleague in your classroom before and you've got your other kids and you've got what you've planned. And then we feel there's a really powerful role for not just one, we think the more people involved with the school community who shadow students for a day, principals certainly, but maybe an innovative and a more traditional teacher, maybe a parent, maybe a student or two shadow another student, but have these different people with very different perspectives go through the school day in the shoes of a student. But looking at it from the point of view of where are kids getting positive reinforcement on skill sets and mindsets we think they really need to develop, what's going on that's sort of neutral to that? and maybe what's going on that could be actually diminishing what's important. So you're seeing the life of your school, uh, snapshots all over, you're just seeing it, you're hearing it, you're feeling it, and you're realizing the work that you have ahead of you. You're realizing that you have some teachers that are still in the 20th century and they don't know why, how, or what it means. And then you're seeing these other teachers that, that know you're there, they're not performing for you, but they're certainly looking out for you and making you feel welcome and part of their journey. And they're trying to show you that they care and that they're excited about uh, project-based learning. They're excited about inquiry. They're uh, excited about Socratic seminar. They're, they're trying to show you on that one day that they're willing to take risks and they're preparing their students for their future and not the teacher's past. That's the amazing thing about shadowing, is that you really get to see your school and your teachers and your students as you really can't any other way. And really looking at how can we best prepare the kids not just academically, but emotionally and, and um, personally for the future, to go out and have that sense of self and sense of place. So even if they leave Molokai, they take that piece with them to share. Hopefully they come back and they make Molokai um, better. What in your mind would represent a good set of essential competencies for your kids to develop as they come through? the experience at your school. We took the opportunity to figure out what our kids need to learn and um, talk about some of the skills and dispositions, whatever characteristics they need to be successful outside of high school. If you're able to say we're doing this intentionally because we as a community all agree our kids need to be good at creative problem solving or it's really important for our kids to be very good at collaboration. That's going to be an important capability for them as an adult. Then when you start to do more project-based learning in science or more uh, team-based critiquing of essays in an English class or a whole set of things, when people say, well, that's different, you know, like, why are you doing that? You say, we as a community just agreed that we want our kids to get good at whatever. And so we're intentionally introducing more aspects into the learning environment that promote the very goal we all agree as, as a community. And some people will say, oh, yeah, okay, that makes sense. If you understand the learner profile of your students, hmm. you're going to be a successful teacher and you're going to allow them to be successful students. I think understanding the learner profile is so important, especially for so many new teachers who have never taught. I mean, myself, I taught for six years in Rhode Island. I have totally had to change my entire approach. And if I'm unwilling to understand the learner profile, I'm going to keep 
going up against this roadblock. Yes. I think that's why it's really important for us as a community, as a school, to discuss what the profile is. Because if we don't have a good concept of that as a team, mm -hmm. then how are we supposed to make these shifts? Like innovation, I think, is such a great thing for our school, for our kids, because of their learning profile. And if their learning profile is different, then we would have to shift what that experience should look mm -hmm. like to help meet their needs. And so I think the power of any place, but a, particularly a place like Molokai, to sort of step up and say, we know best. We know what our kids are going to need to be good at, to really thrive, to have a that kind of future that will work for them in their home. I, I think that's really a, an essential step. Um, all of the teachers on our on our island got together and we asked those questions basically what are the essential skills you would like to have um, see our students have when they graduate and they're, so they're helping us to build our profile of a high school graduate and so what we're going to do with that is take all of those and combine them into what our profile of a high school graduate and then that'll be coupled with our teachers are working on um, essential standards so they'll be, they'll be doing the academic side. Education is shifting to focus more on being life successful. Using these attributes that we have in our learner profile, these kids are striving for it now. And they're gonna to continue to build momentum as they strive for the rest of their lives. These attributes are a more accurate measure of future success. And that's the type of energy and passion we want. is all about collaboration and using design thinking. You have to like work with people and share ideas and I feel like that's really important for your future because you know there's not only going to be you there's seven other billion people in this world so you need to communicate and share your ideas and if you want this to be actually global and like governmental. A lot of people say that you should start small and I do believe in that too but it's just not also just where you live. There's bigger problems outside of you, so why not help everybody instead of just helping like a certain group of people? I think the biggest challenge we have is breaking them of eight years of structured education, right? And then asking them to be self-directed learners that they've never been given the chance to do before. Here's a Chromebook, be a self-directed learner, go. To me, the foundation of innovation is passion. What do you care about? And a lot of these kids have never been asked that question. Memorable learning experiences also include some sort of connection between teacher and student, student and student, student and community, um, a feeling of, of the student having created something and being a part of a greater whole. What are the kind of thoughtful innovations, again in the context of small steps leading to big change, that will affect, sometimes dramatically affect, a student's ability to get good at something that matters. And students also have the mindset that, you know, I've been told what to do my whole mm -hmm. life and I don't know how to think for myself. And I think these steps that we've taken the last three years have hopefully helped to shift that mindset for both our teachers and our students. And I look at teaching, I look at innovation, I look at 20% time, the way that I'm doing is, what is your purpose? I keep telling them, this is not a project. This is a mission. It started three years ago when we said, let's stop school the last week of school and we're going to do a design week. Specifically, the block between 11.45 to 1 o'clock every day. That's designated free time called 20% time. So the way we divided our 20% time was having the students to look at those global goals. They were then able to choose the one, their first priority, which one they were most passionate about, felt like they had the most that they could offer in trying to solve some of those problems that are attributed to that, that goal. There's no formal grading. There's no formal credit. It ends every day with relentless reflection, and that's become a phrase here on our campus. We're the last 10 minutes of every 71 block every day. 
right, that we have for 20% time ends in written reflection that all students and teachers should be doing. What I define as what's important about education, which is skills. So to me, a test score, yes, it's a measurable thing. It's important to do well on that test. But when I look at my kids, they've done good if they have left my classroom with certain skills, essential skills, social and emotional skills. My group currently for our 20% time is trying to tackle this idea of microplastics in the ocean. That's, I mean, it's a huge problem and there's no way that one of these kids <coughs> is gonna come up with an idea today, but they might tomorrow. As they're diving into their research and getting into their topics like marine debris and ocean acidification and overfishing, and but they're making these broad connections to everything else in their life mm -hmm. and these global goals, but really it's about life and humanity. When we're doing this huge mural, we're now we're fusing in writing, we're fusing in interviews, we're doing math, we're doing art, we're doing paint, and neither one of our teachers are artists. This is a great way for us to bring back your culture on campus, to do something visual for us to do our skills, and it's gonna be handprints of not just them, but the community. But if they're learning their content in a way that is purposeful, that's meaningful to them, that they get that it's exciting for them, then our test scores are gonna go up. They're gonna to want to be lifelong learners. They're gonna increase and strengthen their academic identity. Because ultimately the whole purpose of our 20% time is how can we make the world a better place. And, and the process should never end. You're never at the end of a PBL unit, you're never at the end of a design thinking, you're never at the end, so it's continuous. So what's driving it? The students ultimately. It is though also, of course, the staff, the administration, a custodian, the community, parents, anyone who can join our community, we more than welcome to help us get to the best place for our students. If you go into a school and say everything you used to do, stop, and starting next Monday, everything's got to be entirely 100% project-based, you know, it just grinds any progress to a halt. So I'm a big believer in what can we do that gives you a lot of insight and experience, but a, a smaller scope project that can be done in a day or two. You know, something that could be done in a class or in a grade. So project-based learning has a lot of different definitions, but I think at its core, uh, it's students doing, uh, making, designing, um, and, and, and creating, bringing into being real authentic products, usually, um, over a sustained period of time through uh, an inquiry process. One of the things I really think is important is that we get kids engaged in their learning and that we try to listen to those students and what they want to learn and how they want to learn it. And suddenly people say, well that was really great, let's do another, let's do another. And then before you know it, it becomes a healthy part of the school experience. Is it every day? Probably not. But kind of each teacher, each class, each grade can find its own level. But having that mix of learning experiences for kids, I think can actually be a healthy and good thing and respects the voice of the teacher to craft classroom experiences in the way they see best works for their talents, their expertise, and their kids. So there's a, usually a question or essential question that's posed um, that's authentic, something like um, how might we reduce the um, garbage um, production of our school? And through exploring that question, students would be asked to create some sort of authentic um, product, uh, a, a public service campaign, a way to actually measure uh, reduced garbage production, for example, um, and then asked through a multidisciplinary approach, looking at the math of it, calculating the actual volume of waste, looking at the different types of waste, maybe looking at sociology, how do we change human behavior, looking at writing projects and saying how, how might I use writing to convince my peers or adults, um, public speaking, again how might I use public speaking to convince people to change behaviors, psychology, um, art, we can create posters, uh, and through this interdisciplinary approach um, actually impact uh, life for real. I think we have some really good small um, and doable steps, things like project-based learning, things like design thinking, uh, that kids aren't just getting um, the academic skills, but they're getting all of those, if you want to call them 21st century skills, or four C's or six C's, um, but they're getting those life skills that'll help them be successful. Uh, those skills are um, outcomes 
that are more easily achievable through real life, authentic, relevant learning. The main role I play in my class is to provide a venue by which students' questions um, enable them to find answers and I can be comfortable with not knowing everything. And so that changes my life dramatically because I spend more time thinking globally about what's the purpose of our time together? How do I know that they're engaged? The end isn't just something they know, but it's the process by which they got there. And so I spend more time observing, conversing, laughing, um, and it's changed the set of skills that I use because I've become better at listening and being present and seeing what they're doing instead of thinking about what I'm doing. So I think that when we look at ways that we um, start from curiosity, start from wonder, start from awe, start from inquiry, uh, we build those learning opportunities and then we look for engagement in our students. Because it's what got me excited about wanting to work with students in the first place. Their energy, their focus, their desire to see it through and to have a reason for doing it and their disappointment if they don't get there because they know it means something. And that is an artful piece of work. That isn't something you learn in a day. It's something you're continually crafting um, as you work with your students over months and years of doing this kind of facilitated learning. You go to a lot of places and the discussion in the class, if there is discussion, which sometimes there isn't, but when there is, it's some variant of students playing, guess what's on the teacher's mind. When the teacher steps to the side and students are debating each other, you get a very different type of exchange because now if one student says something that a different student doesn't agree with, they're a lot more willing to challenge that view. And I think the role of a teacher is to coach kids on how to provide constructive challenge, to ask helpful questions, to raise the points in a way that's positive. But when that happens, I just observe these dynamics where kids that you view as being disengaged start to jump in. When I first saw Most Likely to Succeed, it was shown to our faculty by our principal, who is very committed to um, innovating schools, and especially Molokai High School. Um, the sequence that they showed with um, the students learning how to do Socratic seminars, and struggling in the beginning, and then becoming confident in articulating their own thoughts was really captivating for me. It seemed to me that Socratic Seminar was a tool that would really allow students to feel ownership of what they were participating in in class, um, that they might be able to see a complex issue or a difficult text as something that um, they can properly delve into. The topics ran from something very light to eventually to deeper conversations. And, you know, we, we couldn't have gotten to the deeper conversation if we didn't have them practice with uh, more easygoing topics. Pinky started to develop uh, her assessment tool um, to tabulate different types of um, input that students gave during the Socratic seminar while I followed um, with my own form of drawing out the Socratic seminar. It took a while for some students to really break off of the routine and to just naturally engage with the topic and then there were a couple of them really started to take some leadership roles in driving the conversation and that was really fun to watch. Students who never comfortably spoke before in a classroom environment were speaking. They were engaged. They were listening to their colleagues. And then there were some students that um, love to talk, but they would never participate in Socratic seminar unless uh, prompted by their peers. Did they validate a classmate's uh, comment? Did they, um, you know, um, introduce a new idea? A synthesis of ideas um, gets really exciting when it starts to occur naturally in the classroom, in the Socratic seminar. Um, 
especially among students that um, have shown a lot of hesitance to speak, but then they start to really flow in a, a pretty neat academic conversation and that um, is fun to experience and watch and that you feel like you have a breakthrough. This is what we hear back is, is, oh my gosh, it worked way better than I thought. Oh my gosh, it was actually fun for me. I thought it might be more work, but it's actually maybe a little bit less. It's different work, but it's, it's engaging work for the teacher. And that students are back to developing essential competencies of asking thoughtful questions, of collaborating with each other to elevate the discussion, to forming their own independent points of view. I feel really passionate about students being able to um, to think clearly and deeply at the same time and I think the, the open-ended format of Socratic Seminar is a very um, useful tool to facilitate that in a classroom of a variety of learners. They come from an oral tradition anyway, so once they talk about things, it just seems to open up different things for them. It gets them engaged, it gets them excited, and it helps, it gives them motivation to write when we ask them to write about it. It was hard, exhausting work, but good work and rewarding work. Well, I can't take credit, I've only been here for five years, but this school's always been about excellence, and so we've always believed in public displays of work. So about eight years ago, we were authorized as an international baccalaureate world school, and a part of that is our fifth grade exhibition. Every year, our students get better and better at becoming intrinsically motivated and driven with passion to impact the community. So you hear student topics like homelessness, ocean debris, and it's something as simple as uh, too much traffic. You know, as I travel across the country, I don't find anybody very enthused about current accountability measures, current assessment metrics. You know, that there aren't staunch defenders of SATs or ACTs or, you know, just the general set of things you know, that we put into the magazines that we hold up as indicators of better or worse learning in schools. So if we've got bad metrics, if we've got bad accountability measures, we won't replace them with nothing. We need to replace them, complement them initially, and then over time replace them with something far more informed, revealing, aligned with real learning in schools. Standardized tests are becoming so old-fashioned. They're supposed to be a predictor of success for our students, but really, we now we know that there are so many more powerful assessment tools. And so on one end of the spectrum, you have standardized tests. And then on the other end is something you'll see tonight, which is our fifth grade exhibition, which is public displays of work. Public exhibition is all about the students, and it's only when they live through that process are they able to speak from the heart. It's really about failing and getting back up. It's about having those arguments with their group members and then figuring out a way to work together. Only then, when they're interviewed on exhibition night, can they share their ups and downs and their entire inquiry journey. Student agency for us is defined as voice, choice, and ownership of the student's learning. Intertwined in this process are the lines of inquiry and the key concepts we want to focus on, and above all, the attributes of our learner profile. Every student has a project that they're passionate about, and at the beginning, there's lots of struggles. But about midway through, they go through this phase called the crunch, where they start pulling it together, and they start emerging their talents, and they start applying their learning. Exhibition is driven by passion. Teachers guide with inquiry, and students speak from the heart. Where they take tangible examples of excellent, proficient, adequate, maybe subpar student work, by a topic or not, by grade level or not, and then 
you're able to map a kid's work and say, this work in our mind is proficient for these reasons and you have some comparables. And I think that's a more authentic way to go about it. If we want to teach students how to make good decisions, we can't tell them how to make good decisions. They have to actually make decisions and learn from that. Just like with projects, students have to engage in authentic projects and that's going to push them to become life successful. When students perform a song, after the performance, that song continues to play in their head and it continues to push them towards mastery. While with exhibition, the song that plays in their head is the impact they made on the community. And so after exhibition, they continue to learn and master compassion. Our fifth graders have been doing this for eight years now. And so anyone that says this can't be done, well, we're proof that it can. Can we put tools in the hands of our educators so they can create the conditions themselves in their school or their complex so that they're learning from each other, so that they're coaching up, inspiring, generating this sense of we can do this, find opportunities that are totally mesmerizing for kids and think of it in the context of what can we do to create a new opportunity here, to solve a problem we're concerned about and pull multiple teachers in. And when that starts to happen, I think people get this sense in a way that's not dramatically overhauling everything, but a short burst with permission and encouragement, with teachers collaborating and students connected to real world problems. And so there's really this different perspective of watering plants versus planting seeds. And we're really trying to put in place the right conditions so that those seeds sprout up and you get lots and lots of new growth. Here you've got you know, the luxury of great weather year round, the, the, the incredible advantage of such, being surrounded by such beauty that just is this natural platform for drawing kids in to do the types of initiatives that just get them you know, every morning saying, I can't wait to get to school. I mean, you've got a lot of people doing remarkably innovative things across all your islands. And so when that stops being kind of the outlier experience, and starts being the enthusiastically received experience when there's that shift of the average parent or the average legislator or the average business person from why are they doing that to why isn't everybody doing that and you're seeing that shift right now I just get so excited by seeing what you're doing here and I do think you're changing the life trajectories of, of 250,000 kids with the great work that's happening but, but it's broader than that because you're really sending a signal around the world that, that people can change, that systems can change, and that getting that transition now from change happening slowly to change happening quickly, and it's a joyful, ex inspiring, exciting change. I mean, this is where, where people are getting up on the surfboard and riding the waves, and you know, you might say maybe, could I crash, could this be a wipeout, except that everybody's staying on their surfboard here. And then people are starting to say, whoa, not only are they big wave surfing, there are a lot of people on these islands that are big wave surfing. And by the way, it's incredibly exhilarating. I think it's important that people know how much passion there is in the existing system. And it's imperative that we give people um, a like of that credit that they deserve. They're transforming a system that they're comfortable working in, and that takes a lot of personal oomph, and it really is a demonstration of the commitment they have to our children. Well, you can tell the health of a school by what you see when you walk around and see how people interact with each other. If teachers look and feel comfortable um, that's the result of a really innovative place where everybody's comfortable with making mistakes and just keeping it rolling. I mean, it's interesting to see all the people coming out of the woodworks now who want to do new things or who want to try something different. But it's really allowing them to have that, have that space to do that and trusting that they're going to be okay. And we, we owe that to the kids. We owe it to them. And it needs to feel real. 
And we have to change our mentality. And if you're a teacher in a school, we are the backbone. Mm -hmm. We are the change. We decide what happens. We need to empower ourselves too of what we know is right. When you ask kids why are they doing what they're doing in school, those answers can be very revealing. And when kids start to answer with things like, I'm doing this because I have a deep curiosity about it. I'm doing this because I want to make the world better by producing this or creating this. I'm doing, you know, like when kids have real reasons to do it, you see exceptional motivation there and, and far better accomplishment. How do we get ourselves as teachers, as students, as a school to trust that intuition, that deep wisdom that cannot be defined? Not everything has a definition. Not everything has a prescription. That's innovation. That's where education needs to go.